okay great so um, let's continue the <coughs> photosynthesis that we were discussing in the last class so in the last class um we were looking at the you know the zut scheme of uh, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 in cyanobacteria and uh, uh, plant chloroplasts so so we, we saw how the light harvesting system you know works and uh, how the light harvesting system contains what are called antenna chlorophylls and from the light absorbed by them gets trans the energy gets transferred to neighboring uh, molecules by a process called exciton transfer and that whole array like structures we called as the antenna light harvesting antenna and then finally from all such uh, molecules you have the energy transfer to the reaction center so we saw the reaction center p680 and p700 in photosystem or uh, two and photosystem one so today what we are going to do is we are going to see one uh, important regulatory step that happens there and then we will move on to how the electrons that are uh, you know the transferred due to excitation to the electron carriers like for example ubiquinone getting reduced to uh, ubiquinol and then finally to cytochrome b6f complex and to the next photosystem so how the electron lost from the reaction center is um, you know replenished from water so that is our uh, next discussion so then the third we will move on to actually synthesizing a carbohydrate molecule by taking the carbon dioxide so so that is the carbon assimilation reaction so first let us uh, look at <clears throat> the photosystem one and the photosystem two so photosystem two uh, so, so in this diagram what you are seeing in this cartoon um so this is the stacked granule like thylakoid where these are oppressed against each other and while this is at the top or this is at the bottom where they are exposed to stroma also these sides so if you look at the diagram you you don't see this photosystem one in the oppressed region okay so here you don't see it and um, you see photosystem two primarily only in that region and you have this light harvesting antenna that is harvesting uh, you know the light energy for photosystem one uh, sorry photosystem two are in close proximity so this regulation is required because the energy uh, required like the, this one photosystem one actually gets excited at wavelength 700 requiring lesser energy than the one that requires um, required by the photosystem two which is 680 so as a result the um, exciton harvesting by this uh, light harvesting complex can actually uh, be lost to photosystem one more readily to photosystem two so the these light harvesting antenna could actually be transferring the exciton energy into this one because this requires less energy than this because this is this is excited by wavelength having less energy p700 okay so as a result what would happen if they are randomly uniformly distributed then photosystem 2 will not get excited frequently so this will be under excited chronically while this will be over excited so if this is over excited then the electrons lost from this will not be fulfilled because the electrons lost from this comes from plastocyanin which ultimately gets it from the excited photosystem too so to avoid this problem there is a regulatory mechanism that uh, plays a role and that is what is shown by this asymmetric distribution so the photosystem too is present uh, tightly uh, in a uh, stacked regions of the 
uh, thylakoid membranes in this granola like structure and this tight um, oppressing of these membranes is mediated by the light harvesting antenna of photosystem 2 itself and as a result these are immobilized and this ensures the spatial suppression from photosystem 1 ensures that the exciton transfer from for the LHC2 actually goes to photosystem 2. This ensures that the photosystem is, uh, photosystem 2 is adequately excited. So, when you have bright light uh, with the heavy component of the blue region, then you have this um, excited more frequently than this and therefore the ubiquinone is reduced to ubiquinol form and reduced ubiquinol form is very readily available. And the electron transfer from this to the next step is therefore needed to be speeded up because you have more UBH2 and from that the electron should flow via the cytochrome B6F to blastocyanin and to photosystem 1. And if the UBH2 UB, that is a reduced, fully reduced ubiquinone, if its level is very high, meaning this system is getting adequate excitation, then that activates an enzyme as shown in this cartoon, a protein kinase that phosphorylates a, therine, a sorry, threonine residue on the LHC2 and that leads to a conformational change such that it is no longer anchored on the other membrane of the thylakoid and it detaches. And when it is detached and this structure is relieved, then this is free to go and harvest photons for photosystem 1. Okay, so now the UBH2 fully reduced ubiquinone produced by photosystem 2 gets consumed by this. On the other hand, when you have um, dim light with more uh, component coming from the red region, then this will deplete of the reduced ubiquinone and then you will have more oxidized ubiquinone and the presence of more oxidized ubiquinone drives the opposite reaction by activating this enzyme protein phosphatase. And when the threonine is uh, dephosphorylated, then that leads to a conformation change in LHC2 such that it anchors to the adjacent membrane and it gets tightly oppressed. Then it, it, it is locked in position with the photosystem 2 and whatever little light that it gets, the energy absorbed is ultimately used to activating or exciting photosystem 2. So this way the light, uh, you know, depending on the light intensity, the light harvesting is regulated such that you have a balanced or optimum production and consumption of the ubiquinone. Essentially not consumption of ubiquinone, the oxidation reduction of ubiquinone to ubiquinol and back. So that is how equalization of electron flow in photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 is modulate, modulated by light itself. So light ultimately activates these two enzymes. Depend, bright light activates this, dim light activates this. So this is what they call as lasceny, meaning um, getting siphoned off or you know photosystem uh, stealing the electrons from photosystem 1, stealing it from photosystem 2. So that's where they use the term larceny. So, so that is about the regulation of how uh, electron flow in photosystem 1 and 2 happens. So next let us look at the cytochrome B6F complex itself, which is equal to the mitochondrial complex 3. So this is again, uh, we have already uh, seen this. So we saw this with the purple bacteria, which has only photosystem 2. And then we saw green sulfur bacteria, which has only photosystem 1. So, so there again, we saw the electrons 
from the excited state flow via the cytochrome B6F complex back to the reaction center. So, and uh, this uh, structure, I told you at that time, is very similar to um, the one in mitochondria complex 3, which oxidizes the fully reduced ubiquinone, essentially it's called ubiquinol, by transferring electrons to cytochrome F on the uh, mitochondrial uh, inner membrane side. Okay, so where then the cytochrome C moves to the complex 4 and um, transfers the electron there to you know, oxygen there. So here, a uh, very similar structure. So the first part on the left side, you see without the amino acids, without the protein backbone, we see only the prosthetic groups. And you have the heme moieties here. So the blastocyanin is the final one. This is a protein, okay? So although the name kind of resembles to the pigments we learned, but this is a protein, which is functioning like cytochrome C of the complex 3 in mitochondria. So electrons finally move to this blastocyanin and blastocyanin transfers to photosystem 1. So, so that has, um, so before that you have this um, cytochrome F with this uh, heme F moiety. Then the cytochrome B6 itself contains uh, a heme B and an iron sulfur center, then you have the heme BH and then another heme called heme X. And there is also a beta carotene, although we currently do not understand the functional contribution of beta carotene here. And the electron flow diagram is shown by this blue arrow. So this is the reduced form of ubiquinone called ubiquinol and from there, through a Q cycle mechanism that uh, we'll see once more in the next slide, but we have elaborately discussed that with respect to complex three in mitochondria. So from there, um, electron flows this way and you get the oxidase ubiquinone. And um, then finally to cytochrome, uh, this uh, F and from that to blastocyanin. So, so this is the part of the electrons here. And during this process, the conformational changes that happen in this complex uh, through the, the, due to the electron flow ends up pumping protons across the membrane, just like what complex three in mitochondria did. And on the right side, you have the structure having the protein. So it is a dimeric structure that you see here. So this is the, um, this portion on the top, uh, on the luminal side or the P side, the positive side, you are seeing the um, cytochrome F with the heme F that's shown here. So this one, this structure here. Okay, and the other molecule, the, this is the dimer, so the other heme F is here, this one. And the other hemes, um, this heme B, heme X are shown here. And uh, so it forms a canal-like structure or a cavern or a valley-like structure. And that allows the free diffusion of the ubiquinone or ubiquinol um, in, in this structure. So this is the Q cycle, the very same thing that we saw in a very abbreviated way. There we saw two separate UBH, uh, you know, you reduced uh, QH2 binding and how one electron goes to cytochrome C and the other one gets cycled back to reduce the semi-ubiquinone uh, uh, semi that was formed due to, uh, you know, one electron transfer. So the same thing here again, from the fully reduced one, you have one electron going via this ion sulfur, again this rice um, ion sulfur protein to cytochrome F to plastocyanin. Okay, so this is a copper containing enzyme, but it is not similar to complex 4 in mitochondria. And the other electron via this uh, cytochrome B6 through these two heme moieties go back to reducing that um, 
free radical version, the radical version of the partially reduced ubiquinone uh, called semiquinone. And that whole detail is not shown because we have already seen elaborately. And a similar Q, Q cycle operate, operates here to ensure two electron donation by the fully reduced ubiquinol, but transferring only one electron at a time to uh, plastocyanic. Uh, in this case, the this space, um, yeah, so this area is extremely narrow. Okay, so compared to the stromal uh, side, when I showed you the chloroplast structure with uh, stacked thylakoid membrane, you know, green structures inside the orange that you saw, and inside the green is what this space, this lumen. This is really, really small place. And as a result, when the protons are pumped into this by this um, complex, the pH gradient really is about thousand fold. Okay, the proton concentration inside the thylakoid room, uh, lumen is so high. It's um, pH 5 and outside in the stroma it is pH 8. And therefore there is a thousand fold difference in proton concentration sufficient enough for ATP synthesis. Okay. So our next main topic in photosynthesis, uh, the, uh, the light reactions part, the first part of photosynthesis is this water splitting by the oxygen evolving complex or water splitting complex. So it's known by both the names. So essentially the primary thing here, what happens is four electrons and four protons are taken away from two molecules of water. Okay and the four protons are pumped into the lumen. Um, so this is the second uh, event of proton pumping that we are seeing. One, when the excited electron returns, uh, rather moves to the photosystem, one via the chain of electron carriers, um, in, the, in that pathway, we just saw the B6F cytochrome pumps protons. And the next one that we are seeing is the water splitting complex itself. And the four electrons, so four protons are pumped into the lumen. And the four electrons that are taken up, they go into reducing this manganese ions. So manganese can exist in uh, you know a stable oxidation state between plus two and uh, plus seven so it can very readily take four electrons in one go or it can take one electron at a time readily four electrons in sequence and it can also get oxidized by giving out one electron at a time or giving four electrons at a time and that flexibility of manganese ion is uh, very smartly uh, co-opted by this water spreading complex. Okay. And that is how the four electrons that are taken away from two water molecules are given one electron at a time to the reaction center. If you remember the cartoon that we saw in the last class or the class before, that green re vertical rectangle like things. Um, when an exciton energy is transferred, like one photon equivalent is transferred, one electron is uh, donated by the reaction center, creating the electron hole there. And that's how the charge separation happens. So it loses only one electron at a time. And from the electron donor, it takes only one electron at a time. But here, when you split uh, water into oxygen and uh, protons, you get four electrons in one go from two molecules. When you produce molecular oxygen, you end up consuming two molecules of water. And these four electrons, the reaction center cannot take in one go. It will take only one at a time. And that uh, situation is what is uh, very ingeniously handled by the water splitting co complex 
taking the uh, multiple stable oxidation states of manganese ion into um, good advantage. And the electrons from the manganese ion is transferred to um, pyrosine residues on this complex. And um, so the textbook says the crystal structure solving of this complex was one of the most challenging among crystallizing and solving structures of proteins. And the mechanism has not been fully deduced. Okay, so this is the model that is supported by the available experiments, and this is what currently we know. But there are still some nitty gritty details that need to be uh, filled. And this tyrosine residue is the one that takes up the electrons, and from the tyrosine residue, it goes to um, the next um, the reaction center that is uh, P680. Okay. And this is how from water electrons are transferred into the reaction center. And from the reaction center, of course, it goes via the carriers and finally reducing NADP into NADPH plus H plus. So hydride transfer, like two electron, one proton transfer happens at the end of the two photosystems. And uh, so that is where the electrons have gone. So they, they have gone and the protons have also been taken up when it comes through through the ATP synthase, then you have the uh, re reduced equivalence NADPH generated there. And when the protons are ret returning, ATP is also produced. So you have reducing equivalence for the dehydrogenase reactions, and then you have the energy to drive them, ATP, both are available. So that it, it, it can now readily go and do carbohydrate synthesis like in loosely speaking opposite of what we have learned so far through glycolysis and tca cycle uh, i am saying loosely because it's not the exact reversal and in the process from water you have the oxygen evolving out and this is how the atmosphere got its oxygen from water only you get it okay it is not from carbon dioxide and similarly we saw in the mitochondria the electrons coming from the donors like NADH or FADH2 succinate dehydrogenase reaction, they finally go to reduce oxygen to water. Okay, the exact opposite ends up happening in mitochondria. And there, carbon dioxide is liberated from glucose kind of molecules. Here, the carbon dioxide now we are going to see is going to be used. To make glucose kind of molecules. So we will not uh, discuss the ATP synthase in great detail because it's essentially the same as what we saw in mitochondria. You have the FO subunit, oligomycin sensitive subunit. So do not call F0 or F0. And you have this F1 ATPase and the same rotational catalysis instead of inner membrane space of mitochondria, inter membrane space of mitochondria, here you have the thylakoid. And the instead of matrix of the mitochondria, here you have the stroma of the chloroplast. Okay, this open, this bluish area. So, so this, this cartoon actually is a summary of whatever we have learned. So you have the light reaction, uh, here light exciting and all the uh, antenna, all that we know here and from here you have that b6f pumping proton into this and this is the water splitting complex itself producing uh, protons and evolving oxygen then you have it flow into b6f and from that to blastocyanin and blastocyanin is exactly like the cytochrome c in mitochondria this is again on the surface inside there that is on the intermembrane side, here it is on the luminal side of the thylakoid to photosystem 1, which again uh, get excited by light as well. And from there the um, electrons go via ferredoxin to uh, ferredoxin oxidoreductase reduces NADP to NADPH. So that is where from water the electrons have gone into. So from here, this will be used and combined with the oxygen, the carbon dioxide to make the carbohydrates. 
and uh, the proton gradient created here by these two water splitting complex here and then this uh, cytochrome B F, uh, B6F complex that when it flows down the gradient then you make the ATP. So reducing equivalents as well as ATP are produced by the light reactions. So up to now the light is absolutely essential for these reactions to happen. Essentially, we have light energy now in chemical potential energy. Okay. So, this is uh, like the guy standing on the tall diving board. Okay. So, potential energy is very high. And the required electrons and protons are here. Okay. A small detour into evolutionary history before we go to the carbon assimilation reactions. That is a simpler um, a pump, proton pump, which is directly activated by light. Okay, so there is no such complex thing like this, where you have a separation of activation and pumping, uh, etc. So this one, what it does is, uh, this is uh, this uh, this molecule is called the bacterial rhodopsin. Rhodopsin simply because like the protein in our rods and um, uh, rod cells in the eye, in the retina. Um, so we already know retinal, retinoic acid, retinaldehyde, all that because uh, we have learned that in the studying the fat soluble vitamins. So there I told you the cis-trans isomerism happening in the double bond of the retinal uh, changing from cis to trans activated by light and then that returning back to cis that alternating the cis trans isomerism of retinal is uh, used for sensing light in our eye a very similar thing here and that is why this is also called a road opsin uh, opsin optical so it is about the light and then uh, uh, this rod cell is probably from where this rhodopsin name comes. <coughs> so here, very similar thing. One only thing is here, there is no brain sensing and making an image. Instead, this cis-trans isomerism happening due to light uh, absorption by this retina is used to alter the conformation of this protein such that the amino acid side chains end up donating accepting protons and eventually leading to proton pumping okay so the light energy uh, alternate the cis trans configuration of uh, uh, configuration of the retina and that changes the conformation of the protein such that the protein ends up pumping proton okay and this is uh, helpful for bacteria living in extreme saline environment okay so uh, the extremely saline environments can have a uh, salt concentration as high as 10 power 4 molar or 10 power 5 molar sodium chloride in such a high salt concentration environment although this bacteria like us uses oxygen and burns fuel like glucose available from the surrounding media to obtain uh, its atp and energy requirement the oxygen availability in such environments is very low and due to that it supplements its energy requirements by using this protein and making some atp uh, synthesis so when light directly activates bacteria rhodopsin and pumps proton, then you have a proton gradient generated. And when that proton gradient goes via the ATP synthesis, you get some ATP produced. Okay. No reducing equivalent, no other carbohydrate synthesis, nothing. A single molecule uh, responding to light and undergoing confirmation change pumps proton across and the proton gradient is used to make ATP. 
So this is how it supplements the normal oxidative phosphorylation, phosphorylation by a means without, without requiring the oxygen. So the, under low oxygen condition, this bacteria benefits by the supplemental ATP synthesis. Okay, so halophilic means salt-loving bacteria. So these are so adapted to the salty conditions, uh, they cannot live in a uh, you know, less salt solution, leave alone fresh water. So you know, there are places on earth where you have, um, you know, all sites surrounded by mountains. So therefore, whatever little rain uh, that falls on the mountains, they come to the middle bowl-like valley and they know what flowing out from there it never rains to fill the whole bowl and the overflow and the water evaporates there itself and leaving the salt behind okay so the rain falls on the mountains dissolves the minerals and salts comes to the valley forms a lake and when it is summer the water evaporates but the salt stay there and in such environments, the whatever water that remains on that salt, they are called a brine, B-R-I-N-E, brine. That's extremely salty water. And in such environments, you find this bacteria. So a, a little bit detail about this, uh, electron, sorry, proton pumping. This is primarily because we learned what is proton hopping, right? This water is slightly ionized and that proton is readily taken up by a water molecule forming a hydronium ion. And since water molecules are electron, sorry, hydrogen bonded, such protons resulting from ionization through this hydrogen bonding can readily hop instantaneously to long distances. And that time I told uh, that kind of proton hopping is really very useful for catalysis at the enzyme active site. And here is one such example we see here. So, so in this protein, so here this is the retinal molecule and uh, in the dark condition, this lysine side chain, this um, you know protonated shifts base, um, is uh, this has a high pKa th that is ensured by the protein conformation and uh, upon illumination the retinal structure changes uh, such that the amino acid is positioned closer to another one and the and that conformation change leads to reducing the pKa of this uh, group shifts based uh, nitrogen and that readily donates the proton because its pKa value is reduced and therefore um, it, uh, in a, even at a lower pH it readily donates proton. And that via a series of uh, proton hopping shown here, you know, from threonine 89 to aspartic acid 85 and 82 and so on, it comes to the other end of the membrane. So this is the membrane. And uh, finally, from the when these things undergo conformational change, their pKa also changes such that they donate the proton. Only thing is when they proton, donate the proton, it is into the cytoplasmic side of the bacteria. Okay. Um, so, sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry. They, they, through the uh, extracellular side, in the periplasmic phase. So that is where it ends up pumping. So between the cell wall and the cell membrane, you create a higher concentration of proton and compared to the cytoplasm. And when it returns via the ATP synthesis, that leads to energy um, synthesis, uh, uh, ATP synthesis. So, so the main point here is the conformation change affects the pKa of this group as well as this. And as a result, upon in, uh, illumination, the lowering pH leads to proton donation and that via this amino acid side chain, enabling proton hopping, it comes to the other side. And since this one's pKa also is reduced, 
it readily donates the proton, but that proton is donated into the periplasmic space. Now this proton donated by this needs to be fulfilled and that is done by um, another uh, uh, you know amino acid in this case aspartic acid 85 and that eventually takes that proton from the uh, cytoplasmic site. So essentially you are pumping from cytoplasm to the periplasmic membrane protons but whenever illumination happens. So this is how the bacterial rhodopsin works. So well before going and studying the photosystem 1, photosystem 2, etc., uh, people focused on the bac bacterial rhodopsin because it's an extremely simpler protein and easy to purify, crystallize, like relatively compared to the other ones. And um, so th this is one of the light sensitive molecular machines that you encounter. There is one more photolyase that helps in um, thymidine uh, dimer repair in DNA so that you probably will learn in molecular biology. Okay, so that is all about uh, light reactions. So now we are going to use the reducing equivalents produced in the form of NADPH and the chemical potential energy in the form of ATP. And we are going to hydrolyze the ATP and the energy released will be used to drive the reduction of carbon dioxide into triose phosphates and then into hexose phosphate, etc. So that is what is going to happen in the carbon assimilation reaction. And for this, you do not need light. It can happen in the presence as well as absence of light. So this cartoon gives you an overall view of what is happening. Okay, from carbon dioxide and water, you have the triose phosphates formed and from them to hexose phosphates. And this may be converted into disaccharide sucrose and that is transported to other parts of the plants like to root and storing in the roots. And sometimes in the stem itself, like for example, sugarcane, that's why sugarcane juice is uh, sweet because sucrose is there. So sucrose is the form in which it is transported. So that's an important concept you need to remember. So the, the form in which the carbohydrates produced in the leaves are transported to other parts of the plants is in the form of sucrose. And in grains like uh, rice and wheat, barley, etc., or potato, cassava, in all of them, the storage is starch. You know, glucose, and when we know that starch is a polymer of glucose. And for cell wall structure, you have cellulose. And this one pathway that we didn't uh, cover during our uh, carbohydrate metabolism. We saw glycolysis and we saw TCA cycle, but there is one more pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway or uh, P PPP, triple P pathway or HMP shunt in memory of the, in honor of the scientists who discovered that pathway. So essentially that pathway, we are not going to go into it. I am briefly telling you what is the essential function of that pathway. That pathway produces pentose sugars from the hexose sugars. And the pentose sugars we know are required for nucleic acid production. Okay. And the other intermediates for protein as well as lipid biosynthesis. So some of the hexoses can go into this. So when you look at all of this, you see this, these molecules, this and this. So entire set of macromolecules are uh, covered, molecules of like whatever we learned are all covered. So meaning all of them are produced from carbon dioxide fixation into triose. So this is why carbohydrate chemistry is central in life. Okay, so life is actually carbohydrate chemistry. Um, the other molecules are all produced from car carbohydrates only. Th that is because the way carbon enters into the system is via carbohydrate formation. 
So now let us uh, look at this. We are not going to learn all of this. Okay, so we our focus will only be coming up to this. So we are going to assume, oh yeah, this is um, self-explanatory. We learn, we we'll understand, and also this is the only biochemistry course I'm going to learn. So I'm not going to cover all the branches and details. Okay, before we go into this again. what is the stage in which this drama happens so that's what we are going to first look at it so chloroplast is where all this um light reactions all the, the green thing so this is where um nadph production atp all that is happening right and they are used in the stroma area here and that is where the carbon assimilation reaction related enzymes are located and at the end of this when you produce a lot of um, carbohydrates they are converted into starch uh, starch and that leads to conversion of this chloroplast into what are called ameloplasts ameloplasts do not have this internal membrane structures these are all broken down and the entire space is used for storing starch and such starch filled um uh, structures the, the, these organelles are called the plastids okay my chloroplast is a plastid um you know here is in the title you are the spelling so the plastid filled with the starch and not doing photosynthesis is ameloplast so here is a micrograph of uh, ameloplast iodine stain the iodine binds to starch and you have here the starch granules uh, shown everywhere here so this is starch filled so this is the kind of plastid you will find for example in potato okay potato is not going to have this green chloroplast and these actually exist in uh, homeostasis which form this exist reflects what tissue and what that Uh, so what organ and what its function is for example in leaf where photosynthesis happens they exist in the form of chloroplast in storage organs they exist in the form of ameloplast meaning these are reversible these structures an intermediate called proplastid can assemble the uh, grana and they can become chloroplasts Okay, and chloroplasts can lose them and become protoplastids, and from there they can go and become ameloplasts. So this is a, an intermediate structure called pre-granal plastids, meaning granum has not formed, but the membranal discs, flattened discs, have already formed. All right. So this. Um, is the overall summary of the carbon uh, assimilation reaction like the way we saw the tca cycle circle first and then we went into the individual reactions similarly this is the overall perspective so the scientists who worked out this there were actually three of them belvin bosham and calvin and in that three member group calvin is the main person so he got the nobel prize in 1961 because because this is one of the central aspect of biology okay so this is how carbon enters into the biosphere so carbon dioxide in sense should be called inorganic carbon because it's not part of the living system so but carbon in this form like this carbohydrates they are genuinely products of life and therefore they only are organic compounds organism derived so so this inorganic carbon becomes organic carbon by this cycle so this cycle has three stages uh the first stage is carbon fixation the carbon dioxide gets incorporated into a pre-existing carbohydrate and this pre-existing carbohydrate used here is this pentose or uh, ribulose 15 bisphosphate ribulose okay that ul should sound aldolose like fructose okay it has the like fructose it has a ketone group so this will form hemi ketal if it forms an internal 
you know a linkage so ribulose this phosphorylated in two places so it's ribulose bisphosphate so this five carbon compound uh, becomes two three carbon compounds by taking this carbon dioxide so this is the fixation reaction and next there is a reduction reaction because the end product is three phosphoglycerate this we saw in the reverse order in glycolysis glycerol day three phosphate became uh, actually um, that is one three bisphosphoglycerate that that's what it forms um so that phosphoglycerate is what you we are seeing here in in glycolysis it was the opposite direction so now it is in this way so th this is a re um, reduction reaction because carboxylic group aldehyde group so that's a reduction carboxylic acid to aldehyde group in glycolysis we saw aldehyde becoming carboxylic acid and therefore we called it as oxidation so that's a dehydrogenation reaction as well there so here it is the opposite of that so therefore we call this reduction so that's the second step third is regeneration of the ribulose bisphosphate therefore the cycle can continue and to take care of the stoichiometry we begin this way we begin with three molecules of this so three times five 15 carbons and we take three molecules of carbon dioxide so 18 carbons end up producing six three carbon phosphoglycerates now of the six five of them um, are going to combine so five times three 15 so five carbon three molecules okay the net result is three carbon have become one glycerol day three phosphate which has three carbons in it so this is the stoichiometry three carbon dioxide are fixed with three ribulose bisphosphate producing six trioses okay whether you are talking about this or this six of them of which five are going to make three of this pentose and one is the net gain and that one is going to now form hexose and go into making uh, starch and sugar, etc. So we have the fixation step, reduction step, and the regeneration of the acceptor step. That regeneration step requires the energy in the form of ATP. So I'll stop here. In uh, tomorrow's class, we will focus on the fixation reaction how ribulose 1 by phosphate is converted into 3 phosphoglycerate.